now be looking at the genetics of the tumor and the genetics of the dog and looking at all of the interplay between all of those things and seeing how they might be able to best match treatments and the genetics and ultimately, hopefully, come up with best scenarios for each particular dog. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Hello, friend. Thanks for joining us today. We have a really interesting episode with Dr. Jen McClay as our guest. She is the Chief Scientific Officer, Self-Professed Science Geek, at the American Kennel Club Canine Health Foundation. They fund research that is aimed at specifically dogs, all kinds of health conditions, but 25% of their programming is aimed at cancer research. So she has a lot to share with us about what they're currently doing at the Help Foundation. And she also has some really interesting ideas and things to say about One Health, which I think it's the future of medicine, not just for dogs, but also for humans and every other animal species. Dr. McClay, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I just love the idea of this podcast and what you're doing here, I think is so, so very important. Thank you. There's a, a large team of dog lovers. We call ourselves Team Dog. <laughs> so there's many, many people behind us who make this all happen. We like to say that even the bookkeepers are dog lovers. Oh, when I was chatting with your producer the other day, we spent far more time talking about our dogs than talking about <laughs> the logistics of the show, I think. It's one of the hazards of working on Team Dog. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. No. No, we all know each other's dogs and how they're doing, and we're just as concerned about their health and well-being as... Absolutely. <laughs> as, the as it should be. As it should be. Yeah. So tell me just a little bit about your background and how you came to the Canine Health Foundation. Ah, very good. Well, I'm pretty new to the Canine Health Foundation. I joined just about six months ago. They hired me as the new chief scientific officer at the same time as they hired uh, Dr. Darren Collins, who's a veterinarian, as the chief executive officer. And so we were both very excited to lead the foundation in new and broader directions. You know, the foundation is is certainly not broken. It can continue to do what it's been doing for many, many years. It's been around since 1995, and we're very, very excited. What's really new is the fact that with two new people, we're looking to reach out to so many more dog owners. Mm. It's traditionally been very focused on those who show dogs kind of those people that you see on TV who, you know, on Westminster and the National Dog Show. And and we're here for the health of all dogs. And so from the pet dog that's sitting on your couch right now to people who do agility and scent work and rally and everything in between, we want to reach out to everybody. That's wonderful. And your foundation does not conduct scientific research, but it funds scientific research into dogs specifically. Exactly. So we are an independent affiliate of the AKC. We're the AKC Canine Health Foundation. And what that means is the AKC gave birth to us back in 1995, but then they set us on our way. We are an independent affiliate. We have our own board of directors. And so the AKC doesn't tell us what to do. They are one of our biggest funders, but they don't dictate what we do in any any shape or form. So they do give us money, but we have our own board of directors and our own scientific review committee, and we're based out of Raleigh, North Carolina. When we're talking about One Health as a model, it's sort of a new idea in medicine, isn't it? I think to some extent that's true. and. The I thought it's really interesting that, you know, some of the books that have really brought it into popular culture, of course, were written by human physicians and not veterinarians. <laughs> and so to a large extent, you know, they're preaching stuff that we already know and have said for a long time. But sometimes it takes a human physician to get the attention that it probably deserves. Right. And so the basically one health is the idea that what applies in one species does not just apply to that species, but can, in fact, apply to many species. Right. And that we learn and carry over and have those cross-functional conversations because it's so important and that 
there are people advocating to have common language. I think, especially in a world where we're doing more and more Google searches, if people aren't using the same words, Mm -hmm. you may never come across what they are doing if you're not using the same the same words that they're using. Give me some examples of that. Like what would people be searching for? But because they're using the wrong word, they miss the actual results they're looking for. Early on in my career, I was very interested in, and actually all of my early research was around dietary acid-based metabolism. So what that means is how we eat and what we eat. So as women, we're really interested in avoiding osteoporosis as we get older. And so calcium metabolism is very important to me. And so I was looking at an animal model of osteoporosis and a lot of that metabolism and that dietary work that's done in cattle and milk producing cattle, dairy cattle, is often in the language of dietary cation anion balance. And so if you look up DCAB or DCAD for dietary cation anion difference, then you'll find all of these research papers looking at that and calcium metabolism. But in human medicine, That same calcium metabolism as it's applied to osteoporosis is often around potassium load and potential renal acid load of foods. Oh my goodness. Which is completely different language than (laughs) than the dietary kit on Anna and difference. It's even a completely different an acronym. And so unless you start to come across some common language you would never cross-pollinate those two bodies of literature, and yet they have a tremendous amount in common. That is fascinating. That is really, really interesting. So would you say that in the future, perhaps, veterinarians and human physicians might share a lot more language in order to make sure that all these concepts aren't getting missed? I think it's really important, and I think it's not something that anybody ever does consciously. It has to happen almost subconsciously when you have meetings and scientific symposia and conferences where you put everybody in the same room so that they start talking to each other, and then they have to use the same language, and then that naturally flows into using some of the same language when they publish. And that's what's what's really helpful because if they can't find each other, then they can't they can't communicate together. But I'm not aware of anybody who's consciously going out there and specifically talking about the language and the words that they're using as the primary endpoint. I think it's it flows out of the conversations that scientists have with each other. And there are more of those happening. So what are some of the, you say there's these conversations that are happening more and more often? Are they at conferences or how is that working? How are people talking? This fall, for example, related to cancer, there was a canines as an environmental, oh, let me think of the title again. It was, you know, using dogs as sentinels for essentially the impact of environmental factors related to cancer for humans. And that was a cross-species conference where both human researchers and veterinary researchers came together. And the interesting thing is with COVID, not only were people in the same room, but it was a hybrid conference. So there were a lot of people online as well, which is also the great, you know, it's, it is a positive impact that has come out of, you know, COVID is that many conferences now are offering a hybrid option which really allows whoever is online to participate much more actively with what's going on at a, at a conference as well. Whereas before, if there happened to be any sort of video component, then people might just watch it afterwards, but it wasn't interactive in that way. I think one of the things that is really important in those conferences is that there are veterinarians and or PhDs who have dog advocacy as part of their background so that they're not there talking about the dog as a model for human disease. You know, when we're talking about One Health, they have to be there also talking about the fact that human disease can be a model for canine disease and that we can also 
advocate for that therapies be launched, you know, in both species at the same time, that people get away from thinking of the dog as a research animal. You know, they're they're not a research animal in that context. Here, we're really talking about advancing the health of both species at the same time. And then you extrapolate that to, is it other species? Is it wild canids? You know, how far do we want to really expand that that model along and non-human primates along that same line of reasoning follows? Mm-hmm. When it comes to cancer specifically, which is obviously what our listeners are interested in, Mm -hmm. my understanding is that dogs are our closest species in terms of the physiological cancers they get and what's helping them often helps us. Is that correct? I think that to a large extent that probably is true. I mean, certainly a tremendous amount of cancer research has been done in research animals when we think of mice and rats and that sort of thing. But when we think of naturally occurring cancers, Cancer is the number one killer of dogs, unfortunately. It is something that we as as pet owners and dog lovers have to deal with all of the time is, is the loss of our own pets. It can be a devastating way to lose our pets. Certain forms of cancer can occur very at a very young age or they can come on very quickly. Hemangiosarcoma is certainly one of those. You know, almost everybody knows one. Yeah, you're nodding as so you can tell me that you every day. Yeah. Every single day we do. We have so many stories about somebody, my dog was fine yesterday and today they're gone, unfortunately. And so, you know, the finite lifespan of dogs, the fact that they, you know, live closer to the ground, they live closer to our environment in that regard. They are exposed a lot more to environmental factors, so they can reflect some of that environmental and toxic exposure, Mm -hmm. potentially, so we need to take that into account. You know, it does seem like because of their relative rapid aging, because they live a shorter lifespan, certain cancers can manifest themselves more quickly, and so that may serve as a model for human disease. So we need to look at those things that are common, and we need to look at those things that are different. It may be that certain things, because they are different, don't make them a good model or don't make humans a good model for canine disease. But that's what gives us insight. Sometimes the differences help us ease the science and the physiology apart. And sometimes the similarities help us understand things more deeply. And so that's what's what's really exciting about, you know, that dialogue between human researchers and animal researchers so often. Yeah, it's the future it seems mm-hmm. to me, of medicine is that is taking what we learn across the board and applying it and understanding much more deeply as a result. Absolutely. And then to build on what you just said, you know, the idea of One Health is then you take other specialists and put them in the room and you let them build off of those ideas. You take the large animal internal medicine specialist or somebody who's, as I was talking about earlier, there is actually a line of reasoning that I've followed even in my, in my career to use that as an example from the dairy cow to preventing renal stones and bladder stones and pet foods, designing pet foods for those to osteoporosis in humans. So brittle bone disease later in life. There is a, a physiologic thread that runs through all of those things that seem very different but are actually very, very similar. And you wouldn't necessarily pick up on that unless you have different specialists in the room at the same time. And so you need endocrinologists, people who specialize in things like diabetes and Cushing's disease and things like that to be in the same room with the oncologists because their knowledge can really impact how we think about cancer. Nutrition is certainly starting to get a lot more attention because that can have an impact as well. So we need to think of One Health much more broadly. Right. Have you at the Canine Health Foundation, have you, are you currently funding any studies on nutrition? That's a hot topic for our listeners. It is, especially in the in the area of cancer, not specifically nutrition and cancer. We have ongoing studies related to uh, copper toxicosis specifically and how it's related to liver disease and that sort of thing. In the past, we've had other related studies around growth 
and spaying and neutering and, and that sort of thing. And certainly diabetes plays a big role with nutrition as well, but nothing right now related to cancer and nutrition that I can remember off the top of my head anyway. <laughs> but currently about 25% of our portfolio, about 160 plus studies is cancer related. And uh, and then, and I did just join uh, as chief scientific officer within the last six months. So I'm studying up constantly, <laughs> but uh, sometimes there are subtleties. I think one of the things that we do need to often think about with cancer-related studies is standardizing nutrition between studies, which is really difficult to do. And I think, you know, perhaps for your listeners, talking to their oncologist and that sort of thing and being open to those things can be a challenge because I've had that conversation with researchers in the past around, well, you know, have you thought about standardizing nutrition? And their response is, oh, dog owners would never let me do that. And it's so important yeah. that we consider that as a very important variable, especially if we're studying you know, certain kinds of cancers. I mean, I definitely understand that if we're at the point of hospice, we just want our dogs to eat. Right. And then it's far less important. Whatever they will eat, getting those calories in can be, you know, it's often the final thing that helps us decide whether or not we're going to lose our dog that day or another day. However, if it's a study where we're looking earlier in life mm -hmm. or after a particular intervention, we don't know that interplay between certain medications and nutrition. And so if we do get to that point where we have more of our investigators asking to standardize nutrition, I hope that our, I hope, I hope that our, our dog owners out there would be open to allowing them to do that because it's an important factor, I think. And it's important because just to make sure that everybody listening really understands why this is so important. Food does matter. It has an impact on what's going on in the entire body. And so if you have a great large sample study, like a lot of dogs are enrolled, but they're all fed very, very differently from each other, it's hard to tease out what's going on in the study because you have all of these different variables that you can't control for. You can't know. Right. So you're saying that it would be great if dog owners, when they enroll dogs, if they are asked to follow a certain diet, are open-minded and willing to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we often don't realize that there is a lot of variability between different foods that are on the market, especially with respect to antioxidant levels, such mm -hmm. as vitamin E and vitamin C and things like that, and fatty acids between different foods. And we truly don't know the impact that some of those might have on different forms of cancer and on different medications. Right. So hopefully we will get to that point still a little early. Those studies are difficult to design because by nature, mm -hmm. we dog lovers like to love our dogs with our food. We do. <laughs> we do. And they're hard to design in humans too. For the same reason, right? <laughs> For the same reason. For the same exact reason, because yeah. food is, it's not just a source of fuel, it's a source of pleasure and it's difficult to. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. It's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it is hard. It is yeah. hard. So what are you funding right now? that you're really excited about in the realm of cancer and then anything else that you're excited about? I know that I mean, dog lovers have to deal with lots of different things. Oh, we've got, um, I'm just, I'm very excited in that May, of course, is Cancer Awareness Fund. Mm -hmm. And earlier this year, we had the opportunity to have our review of all of the cancer studies that came in to the foundation. And we were thrilled First of all, the quality of the proposals that come into the foundation from our investigators across the country and across the world really is amazing. And the fact that we can fund so many of them is a tribute to our constituency and to many of your listeners who I'm sure have also supported our studies in the past. In 2021, we were able to sponsor about $850,000 worth of studies. This year, 
It was $1.4 million worth of studies. So that's 13 new cancer studies that are going to launch this year because of the support of dog owners. That is all dog owner stuff. So that is just amazing, amazing, amazing. And one of the things that is really exciting is the depth and the breadth of those studies. So some of them are cross-functional with different companies. So one of them is a study that is cross-functional with Ethos, looking at hemangiosarcoma. Thank you so much, Dr. McClay. I want to take a little break here, and then we're going to come back in a little bit, and I want to talk about that Ethos study. Feeling overwhelmed, numb, and confused is really common in people who are fighting dog cancer. That is why Dr. Dressler put his chapter on emotional management right up front in the book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide. Even if you skip that chapter at first in favor of learning more about conventional treatments and holistic treatments and diet and lifestyle and supplement recommendations that he makes, it is worth going back to that chapter. My favorite emotional management exercise that he recommends is the one called Life Story. Telling my dog her life story from the very first moment I met her right up until today grounds me and it reminds me what we are fighting for and helps me to feel calm and connected. Even when I get long-winded, my dog listens to me tell her life story all the way through to the end and I always get lots of kisses too. You can find this and many other concrete, practical, solid pieces of advice in Dr. Dressler's book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide. It's co-authored by Dr. Sue Cancer Vet, and it is available everywhere the books are sold and at dogcancerbook.com. And we're back with Dr. Jennifer McLay of the American Kennel Club Canine Health Foundation, and you were about to tell us about a study you're really excited about. <laughs> Well, I'm always excited about all of our studies, but I think one of the things that I'm really excited about this particular study is, well, I'm always excited about new ideas and or I'm really excited about studies that are very comprehensive, ones that really want to collect all the data that they possibly can. And I think this one falls into that category. They've come to us and are adding 50 extra dogs into a 400 dog study, which is a huge number of dogs in a particular study. And so there'll be 450 total. There'll be 400, I believe, total. 400 total. Yeah. Wow. And so that's a lot. It that's is a, a huge lot. Increase. It is a mm -hmm. huge increase. And the idea is that all of the dogs will receive treatment, so there's no negative control because that wouldn't be standard of care. Obviously, there are potential treatments out there for hemangiosarcoma, so all the dogs will receive treatment. And they're also looking at the genetics of the dog as well as the genetics of the cancer. And I think this is one of the challenges, and you've probably already come across this, I'm sure, in many of the interviews that you do, that there are certain treatments now that are looking at the genetics of a particular tumor. Mm -hmm. And then there are also tests out there that are looking at the genetics of the dog and that are telling the owner, you know, whether the dog might have a predisposition to a type of cancer. And I think those are very different things. But in both situations, a veterinarian would be talking to an owner about the DNA, right? either the DNA of the cancer or the DNA of the dog. And that could be, I think, a little confusing sometimes. And they both can help guide potentially the therapy that we ultimately might choose as we move in an era of precision medicine. Right. Precision medicine is where you really target a tumor based on its specific genetics. And you say, this is what's going on in the DNA of the tumor. And then we have this drug we know can target that specifically. Right. Okay. There may be eventually a time where we know the genetics of the dog and we put them on a specific therapy to prevent them from having a tumor. Right. That would also kind of fall under that category of... Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be really amazing. And so... That would be know, amazing. That would be a time that we can all aspire to for sure. And then there's this MDMR. Am I saying that right? That there's a genetic mutation that can cause a dog to not take chemotherapy easily because it immediately starts to reject. There's a pump that's activated. 
in the cell walls. Yes. And there are certain, um, I'd have to go. So okay, I'm not, have, yeah, yeah. So it, we don't have to go there. We don't have to but go there. there are certain things in the genetics of a dog that can make a treatment more likely to work or less likely to work, depending on what we know. Right. And that is the key, because some treatments are actually found to be less likely to work. And so that is why sometimes doing some of these tests will be so important, is because we don't want to put them on a treatment that actually will hasten the death of that dog. We always want something that will help them. Right. So in this study, they're looking at the dog's genetic and the tumor's genetics and putting that into the big picture so they'll have more information about how those things play out. Right. They'll have four different treatments, and they'll be looking at the genetics of the tumor and the genetics of the dog and looking at all of the interplay between all of those things and seeing how they might be able to best match treatments and the genetics and ultimately, hopefully, come up with best scenarios for each particular dog with what we know today. And then hopefully they can adapt that, you know, way down the line if new treatments become available. But I think it's a very, very exciting study. It sounds amazing. And that's specifically looking at all of those 400 dogs that are enrolled have hemangiosarcoma. Yes. Okay. So is that a fully enrolled study? It has not been fully enrolled yet. Oh, okay. The portion that we are sponsoring, it is launching and we are still actively fundraising for it, but it's going to happen no matter what. But we're always actively fundraising. You know, even though we've awarded a study, we're more than happy to take donations to help <laughs> sponsor that particular study. So that is one that we're, we're very, very excited about. And do you need more dogs to be included in that study or do you have the 400 dogs already? They are actively enrolling those dogs as they come into the enrollment sites. Okay. So sometimes there are studies where if your dog has a particular tumor, then you can go to our website and see if somebody is enrolling for that study and go to that particular site. Other studies, the dog has to come into that cancer center to be enrolled actively. In this particular uh, study is being sponsored by Ethos Discovery, and those dogs, if they're coming into those Ethos cancer sites, they can be actively enrolled. And there's further information related to that study on our website as well. Okay, we'll make sure that a link to that specific yes. study is included. And then I understand you also have a really good search tool. We do. That people can go to and use to find programs that might be useful for their own dogs or that they can maybe join. Yes. And sometimes it takes a little digging, but if they can't find anything, they can always reach out to us with an email and we'll do our best to help them find what they need because there are 160 different studies. <laughs> it can be a little bit to, to find their way through. Yeah. And of course, they can always go to the AVMA clinical studies website as well. That can often help. Yep. That can help. And then separate from that, because I get at least once a week, I get someone saying, well, my dog has, we have the most generous people who are in our community. My dog has passed. I have some cash and I would like to give it. What's the best way to use it? And so I am always hesitant to recommend charities because I don't want to recommend a charity that isn't um, fulfilling its mission over. Yeah. Right? Yes. So, but I looked up Canine Health Foundation. You guys get four stars from Charity Navigator. So, thank you. Yes. yes, I can confidently recommend. We are very proud of that. We have the highest rating from Charity Navigator, four out of four stars, which is something that we are very, very proud of. It means that the absolute most percentage of your, every dollar that you give us, we turn around and put towards the research that we do. We try to obviously minimize the overhead that we uh, have to pay for because we want all of those dollars to go forward. To go to the dogs. Yep, it goes to the dogs. Exactly, exactly. It's super important to us in our, in our constituency. It means a lot to us. And there's a lot of different ways that people can donate. So it's very nice of you to help. You can donate through our tribute page. So you could 
We always obviously take donations. You can donate to the areas of greatest need. Mm -hmm. You can donate to a specific area of research. So we've been talking a lot about hemangiosarcoma. We actually have a research program area in hemangiosarcoma. So if you wanted to donate specifically to that, you could. If you wanted to donate to cancer in general, you could do that as well. Okay. So you could earmark your donation. Mm -hmm. You can no matter how big or how small, you can earmark it. Absolutely. If you have a veterinarian who has treated you particularly well and you want to acknowledge them, you can send in a tribute to them. I keep saying, you know, somebody doesn't have to have died for you to recognize that they've been nice to you. So so you can do a living tribute for people as as well. And you can do, but of course, you can always do memorial tributes for, for dogs or to people through us as well. And we always acknowledge whoever you want to tribute. You can also purchase a brick that would be at the Purina Event Center that would be laid there. So that's another way to have kind of a permanent uh, memorial somewhere for either a person or a dog or something like that. I was just there last weekend and had a chance to find the Canine Health Foundation has a brick memorializing the dogs that served at the 9-11 crash sites, the search and rescue dogs. So that's a really neat thing that we have that there as well. Yeah. Remind me where the Purina Event Center is. Is that the one in that's your main? It's in at the Purina site in Gray Summit, just outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And that's oh, okay. a service that they that they do with us. So the bricks get laid there, but a portion of the purchase price for the bricks comes to the, support the Canine Health Foundation. Wonderful. Are there any other studies that you are particularly interested in right now? Yeah, well, we've talked certainly about that particular study. There's, oh my goodness, there's so many. There is, <laughs> there is other studies that are looking at, there's a vaccine that's been commonly used in melanoma, and they're examining whether or not that vaccine may have some efficacy in dogs for hemangiosarcoma. So that study oh, is- wow. Is that the Oncept vaccine? I believe that is, but okay. we'll double check that and we can, <laughs> and I can let you know for sure. Okay. And um, let's see, we've got, oh, there is a very interesting study related to spaying and neutering and luteinizing hormone. So for example, in this particular study, we know that hemangiosarcoma tumors express the binding sites for luteinizing hormone. And we know that female dogs that are spayed have increased circulating levels of luteinizing hormone. And that population of dogs is a bit more predisposed to developing hemangiosarcoma. But what we don't know is whether or not luteinizing hormone turns on the replication of hemangiosarcoma, makes it worse, makes it more likely to metastasize or anything along those lines. We really don't know whether or not it's just a coincidence. It could is be it, coincidence. It, exactly. That's the word I was looking for. It could just or, be a coincidence. Or it could be triggering something. Right. Or it could be enhancing something that's already happening or accelerating something. Or yeah, so you're, that's interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. So we have no idea there. And so we've got a pilot study that is being funded to look at whether or not there seems to be a stimulatory factor between luteinizing hormone and those cancer cells. And if they see that in vitro, so outside of the body, then that could lead to additional studies to see whether or not it's a factor inside the body as well. Wow, that's really interesting. So right now you're doing Petri dish. Yes. Yep. And later, if you've eliminated the coincidence, right, <laughs> then you can move into living bodies and see what happens. Right. Wow. Right. That's really interesting. And that doesn't mean they would be giving dogs luteinizing hormone, but they no. would just be seeing no. whether or not there seems to be a driving force in dogs with hemangiosarcoma related to the cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that could ultimately give us a target. If we could block that, then perhaps it would decrease either the aggressiveness of the tumor or the development of the tumor in certain dogs. This is really exciting. How many researchers submit proposals on average in a year? And how many do you actually choose to fund, would you say? Oh, you know, that's a really good question. And it varies a tremendous amount in our different research program areas. So I couldn't give you a single number. We have 
different research program area announcements that go out throughout the year. And as people donate to us, if there is a lot of money, for example, that comes in related to cancer, because it's such an important area, we actually can award cancer studies every year. But other areas often don't get as much money donated to Mm. them. And so we either have to wait until our buckets, so to speak, get more filled for general, so areas of greatest need, and then we can put it towards wherever we need to, or we can have kind of an open call for research proposals. And so some areas, we may not have a call for proposals every year. We may have it every couple of years. But one of the things that I can say is that our award ratio is very high. And part of that is because we try to only have a call when our buckets are very full. (laughs) So when we have... So you're not disappointing people. Well, in a way, I guess guess that's a way to think about it. But we, we have a very rigorous scientific review process. So I wouldn't want people to think that we award you know, scientific projects that aren't good and well thought out. Here you go, out. here you go, yeah, here you go. exactly. Just because, right. just because you're nice, here's the money. Um, <laughs> we have a very wonderful panel of highly knowledgeable scientists that sit on our scientific review committee, of which I'm actually not on officially. And the reason for that is because it allows our researchers to call me up and bounce ideas off me and say, well, what do you think about this? Or how can I improve the scientific design of my study? And we encourage our investigators to do that. And I have experience in in scientific design in in that regard. And and I'm happy to just be a resource for them in general because I'm old and I've been around for a while. And so they can do that. And then that also gives them the ability to go to our scientific review committee when they do submit their proposals. And it's unbiased because I'm not then judging the proposal that I've already given them feedback on. And our scientific review committee grades them using guidelines that are very similar to what the National Institute of Health uses. We use very similar grading system and a a similar rubric. And then only the ones that are the very highest level ultimately get funded. And studies that are very large, that have funding requests over $15,000, are not only reviewed by our scientific review committee, but are also reviewed by external peer reviewers. So we send them out to other world-renowned researchers in the field, and they give us feedback on them as well in a blinded fashion, a masked fashion, so they don't know who they're evaluating, and they can give us that feedback. And so it's all very, very rigorous. But like I said, because of that, and because most of our researchers out there do know what they're doing, and they there's a lot at stake, and most universities have good support systems in place to help investigators submit high-quality proposals. The ones that we see, by and large, tend to be very good. And then we have a wonderful constituency. So our buckets tend to be very full. So we have lots of money. And then if we have a proposal that's really great, we can turn around and go out to breed clubs or to our support people. And we can then say, we have this wonderful study. Can you please support it? And we can backfill if we need to to support studies as well. So right now, we're pretty close to saying, if it's worthy, we'll fund it. And we'll be able to find you the subjects to include. So we'll be able to fill the study so that it can go for it. There's this, there's a lot of leverage (laughs) is what I'm hearing, is that you guys have a lot of, you have your fingers in, in the dog community and then in the research community. And so you've got a lot of resources that you can bring together in a really leveraged way. It's been really exciting for me to get to know the dog community. I'm the research geek of the group. Back in October, they hired me. They also hired a veterinarian by the name of Darren Collins. And Darren is our new CEO. And Darren has shown Salukis and he's been involved in dogs his whole life. I've always had pet dogs, but I've never shown dogs to any great extent. I play in agility and I truly play. (laughs) And so 
Darren brings a lot of that know-how in, and I bring a lot of the geeky science in, and we have a wonderful VP of programs and, and a development director. They know our constituency really well and have been introducing me around. And so that has been super, super exciting. I've gotten to go, if you if you go to our webpage, you'll see me acting like a little kid. I got to play with at the Poodle Show, and I got to go to the Labrador Retriever Show, and I got to go to a couple other shows. I'm going to the Dalmatian <laughs> Show next week, and uh, I'm just getting to meet lots of dogs, and it's really, really fun. Oh, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. I have kind of a general question for you, because it's something I always want to ask everybody, which is, what is the thing, if you could tell someone who's new to being a dog lover, is bringing a dog, their first dog home, what is the most important thing for that person to know about being a dog guardian, someone who is caring for this creature for their lifespan? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I don't think there's any one thing. Mm -hmm. I'd probably say there's a couple things. One is obviously great information, so knowledgeable resources like yourself. Watch out for Dr. Google, team. your team. Yes. You know, um, I think I had a great conversation with a veterinary researcher who was teaching all the veterinary students that they're, he's like, I teach him about Google Scholar. And I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. I think most dog owners don't know that Google Scholar exists. Google Scholar, <laughs> as opposed to Google. Right. <laughs> so there is something called Google Scholar which is actually evidence-based stuff. And right. so use Google Scholar. So that's one of those things. So it's not that you can't or shouldn't look up stuff on your own. Just know the resources that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Develop that relationship with your veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'm a huge advocate for training your dog. So, you know, get out there and join a dog club or your local pet store that might have dog training classes and do some basic obedience, start there, then see if you want to do any dog sports or anything like that, but at least get some basic dog obedience <laughs> on your dog. It'll help with so much. It helps with so much. So much. <laughs> yeah. Just last night, my dog was off leash in a little area where it's safe for her to be with other dogs and mm -hmm. she's got a bad back. So she was going to try to come up the hill towards me because I was at the top of hill and she was at the bottom. And I was like, stay. And you know, she's 13 and a half and she sat and she waited for me to come around and get her. And I thought it was worth it. There you go. <laughs> you know? 12 years ago, I went through <laughs> all of that for this moment. There you go. <laughs> Oh, it's just, and it's just so much fun to bond with your dog, you know, by doing some obedience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are there any other like really juicy things that you want our, our listeners to know about? Well, we've talked about our website a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I would love to encourage everybody to do is come visit us on social media. So the AKC Canine Health Foundation on Facebook, you know, let's cross pollinate each other as far as, you know, liking you, liking us, feel free to reach out to us. It's something that we're trying to do better. If we're doing something well, let us know mm -hmm. if there's something that you would like to know you know, we're open to feedback. So please do that. You'll probably see more posts from us going forward. We're trying to communicate science much more clearly. You'll probably see a change in how we're doing that over the next year. We're trying to be much more visual in how we're communicating studies that we're supporting and results from the studies. So look for that. Consider if you belong to a dog club, encouraging your club to become a member. Last year, we funded $3.4 million worth of studies total. Mm -hmm. And there's 5,000 AKC affiliate clubs out there, our licensed clubs. So that's obedience clubs, smaller all-breed clubs, pure breed clubs. And it's not just the big parent clubs. If all of those clubs became a member, we'd have an additional million dollars to spend on dog research. And that's only $200 a club. That's kind of a bake sale. 
So, <laughs> yeah. So an AKC club can join for two hundred dollars, and that two hundred dollars goes towards Canine Health Foundation. Yes, they can become a member of the AKC Canine Health Foundation. I see. We'll send them a banner, and if they all joined, we would have another million dollars. That would increase our budget by a third. That's amazing. It is amazing. People think, oh, it's just 200 bucks. But all those 200 bucks add up. Who's this? This is Hero. His name is Hero. Yes. All your listeners are heroes too. Thank you so much, Dr. McClay, for joining us today. This was such a delightful conversation. And I'm so pleased to learn more about the work that you're doing at the Canine Health Foundation. Oh, you're very welcome, Molly. It was great to get to know you a little bit. And I have a feeling this will be the first of many conversations that you and I will get to have. Yes. One of the things that you mentioned when we weren't recording is that you would like to come back and give updates on new trials. And I think that is an excellent idea. And I know that our listeners will let us know if that's something they would like to hear is uh, updates on new trials as they come on board. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. Wonderful. Well, thanks again. You're very welcome. And thank you, listener, for joining us today. I found this conversation just so fascinating. I feel like I saw a glimpse into the future of medicine with this whole One Health idea. I know we're going to be hearing more about that in the years to come. And I'm really hoping that Dr. McClay will join us again, maybe more than once, on Dog Cancer Answers to keep us updated on what clinical trials are ongoing for dogs with cancer and what we might want to learn more about in the future. Don't forget to listen and subscribe in any podcast app that you listen to. Follow us on social media. Please join our dog cancer support group on Facebook. It's really very lovely, wonderful group of dog lovers. And don't forget to give your dog a cuddle from all of us here at Team Dog. I'm Molly Jacobson. And from all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'm wishing you and your dog a very warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network. Thank you.